As Donald Trump mauls the guardrails of our democracy by urging his attorney general to hunt down the anonymous author of the New York Times op-ed attacking him, former President Barack Obama today debuted his midterm campaign message to try to save America from Trumpism. The 44th president launching his most direct attack yet against the 45th, calling Trump, quote, a threat to democracy and accusing his Republican enablers of practicing a, quote, politics of fear and resentment. It should not be Democratic or Republican. It should not be a partisan issue to say that we do not pressure the attorney general or the FBI to use the criminal justice system as a cudgel to punish our political opponents. or to explicitly call on the Attorney General to protect members of our own party from persecution, prosecution because an election happens to be coming up. I'm, I'm not making that up. That's not hypothetical. It shouldn't be Democratic or Republican to say that we don't threaten the freedom of the press because they say things or publish stories we don't like. I complain plenty about Fox News, <laughs> but you never heard me threaten to shut them down or call them enemies of the people. It shouldn't be Democratic or Republican to say we don't target certain groups of people based on what they look like or how they pray. We are Americans. We're supposed to stand up to bullies, <laughs> not follow them. We're, we're, we're supposed to stand up to discrimination. And we're sure as heck supposed to stand up clearly and unequivocally to Nazi sympathizers. How hard can that be, saying that Nazis are bad? Good God, Trump makes you miss everyone that came before him. Obama's return to the campaign trail is sure to fan the flames of Donald Trump's inferiority complex. Trump trying to brush off Obama's return with an insult. I'm sorry I watched it, but I fell asleep. <laughs> I found he's very good. Very good for sleeping. <laughs> Actually, it's more likely that Obama's presence on the campaign trail will wake up his coalition of Democratic and independent voters, but there's ample time to test that theory. Joining us to discuss the latest high-level rebuke of the conduct of the current president, some of our favorite reporters and friends. Jeremy Bash, former chief of staff at the CIA and Pentagon, now an MSNBC analyst. Jonathan Lemire, White House reporter for the Associated Press. The Rev Al Sharpton, president of the National Action Network and host of Politics Nation here on MSNBC. Brett Stevens, op-ed columnist for the New York Times. And Mara Gay, journalist and a member of the New York Times editorial board. Jeremy Bash, let me start with you. One, because I've missed you. And two, I want to just... I mean, the juxtaposition today, it was a split screen moment. We have finally achieved the two Americas that John Edwards first talked about in my political career, where on one side of the screen, in 40 percent of America, Donald Trump was urging the sitting attorney general to investigate the uh, identity of the author of that op-ed in the New York Times, um, really rebuking his stability, calling into question his capacity to carry out the duties of his job. On the other side, um, the former president talking about how easy it should be to distance yourself from people who embrace good people on both sides of a KKK rally. Yeah, what President Obama has, has uh, brought here to the fore uh, for the first time in this campaign season, but I don't think it's going to be the last, is this deep concern that we see that President Trump wants to use the apparatus of the national security state to go after his political critics. He wants the attorney general to criminalize free speech, to criminalize free expression, to criminalize criticism, to actually use criminal authorities, the national security authorities, to perhaps conduct surveillance, to find, locate, potentially eavesdrop, potentially arrest someone who is criticizing the president. And it is in line, as President Obama pointed out, with other efforts by President Trump to use the apparatus of the state to go after critics, to threaten to strip 
broadcast licenses from the media that he doesn't support, uh, and, and of course to use other other mechanisms that are totally inappropriate to go after political criticism. And don't believe Jeremy and me. Listen for your own ears. Here's Donald Trump while President Obama was speaking, talking about doing just what Jeremy describes. Let's listen. Because I think it's national security. Yeah, I would say um, Jeff should be investigating who the author of that piece was, because I really believe it's national security. And is there action that should be taken against the New York Times? Well, we're going to see. I'm looking at that right now. Oh, how are you looking at that? But I'm looking. I am looking. You said last night that it's treason. What happened? In this country, we punish treason with the death penalty. Are you serious about that? We're going to take a look at what he had, what he gave, what he's talking about. Also, where he is right now. Jeremy Bash, you worked in national security agencies your whole career. Um, what is the national security implication? I understand the implication of having an unstable man as our commander in chief, but what is the national security implication of penning an anonymous op ed in the New York Times? Nothing. There's no <laughs> national security angle. It's basically a made up rationale to try to, again, use the apparatus of the state to go after political critics. I mean, there, there is nothing that threatens national security in legitimate criticism of our political leaders. In fact, I think I could argue, and I think others would agree, that it would be a national security crisis, a crisis of our democracy of epic proportions, if we use the government to crack down on political critics. So I actually think it's an abuse of power to invoke national security. And I don't know of anybody at the FBI in the intelligence community, the Defense Department, or the rest of the people who are sworn to uphold the Constitution and defend national security who would lift a fingernail to actually carry out this unlawful and unconstitutional order. Um, Jonathan, what does your reporting um, reveal about the White House um, after one of the most brutal weeks of this presidency? You had the Woodward book come out, it seems like um, three weeks ago, but it was the, the beginning of, of a short week. Um, you had um, the president reportedly furious that there wasn't a ro more robust pushback mm -hmm. against uh, the Woodward uh, narrative and the reporting, again, from people within his own White House and a cabinet. And then you had this anonymous op-ed, again, the White House caught flat-footed. No question. Uh, and our reporting is, hits all of those points where this was a book that obviously they knew was coming, but there was no battle plan. There was no set of talking points. They hadn't even acquired a copy of the book until hours after the first story in The Washington Post ran before they finally got their hands on it and started flipping through it. And, you know, they were when the op ed arrived a short time later, uh, they were just as obsessed as we were in trying to figure out who it was. I mean, reporters. Most of them with themselves. Oh, is there anything about me? That's <laughs> that, that, a lot of that. Uh, you know, describe people, people to, you know, inside, outside the building who I talked to, sources who would say, would describe these text chains of people like, what do you think that means? Who could that be? Who could that be? Mm -hmm. And then asking us for our opinions, reporters, like, who do you think it could be? Uh, they, they are definitely uh, sort of under siege right now. There's an element of some defiance, and we saw Nikki Haley's op ed that just dropped a short time ago suggesting that you know, someone should have put their name to it, they should have resigned. There's some people. People in the White House feel like whoever did this, their colleague, was cowardly in, in the way this was, tr was transpired in the New York Times. But the president is obviously very upset, taking this very seriously. The White House has tried to push back a little bit today on his comments there, suggesting that he was just opining about using... Well, he's not a pundit. He's the commander-in-chief. It's a ludicrous defense. Of course he is. And it's a, it's a, it's a flimsy argument. What he is, his, words, his words carry weight. Uh, but that is sort of how they're trying to slow walk a little bit. But we, I spoke to Rudy Giuliani about this, who suggested the argument may be flimsy, but he said the reason why there could be a national security concern is not necessarily that anything in the op-ed was a national security secret, but his reasoning was, if someone was willing to do that, if someone was willing to take the effort to covertly place an op-ed in the New York Times, well, perhaps that person could also reveal national security secrets to the New York Times or someone else. I think that person is probably more worried about the president doing that. I want to ask you about um, President Obama's return to the stage. And we have to say that I, I think everyone looks even better than they did in the moment in the time of, of Donald Trump. But certainly, I, I heard Jim Messina say that, that, that President Obama went farther than anyone thought he would do. And I think that was really a welcome message from Democrats and Republicans. And, and it re-ups the question, where, are, where is Congress? I mean, I mean, why are we so thirsty for this message, this very simple but very strong rebuke of people who can't plainly and easily and quickly um, knock down anyone that stands with Nazis? No, I, I, I agree. I think that 
President Obama, who I had a lot of access to and still stay in touch with, went further than I thought he would. Yeah. But I think that he almost had to mm -hmm. for the good of the country. You know, President Trump says he fell asleep watching him. He should wake up and watch what a president's supposed to deal with. And not just style and carriage, but what the republic stood for. He very meticulously went through Republicans did this and Democrats mm -hmm. did this. And we're at a place now where it shouldn't be about party. And he defined with the state it's supposed to be about and how it's supposed to operate and Trump needs that lesson and I think Americans were hungry mm -hmm. to hear that and we don't see that leadership in the Congress now we certainly are not seeing it from either side he gave the gravitas of what the American dream is supposed to be even for those of us that don't feel we equally shared in it somebody need to bring us back let, there. let me play something for you let me let me play Obama on Republicans because I thought this was some of the strongest condemnation that he had in this speech they're undermining our alliances, cozying up to Russia. What happened to the Republican Party? Its central organizing principle in foreign policy was the fight against communism, and now they're cozying up to the former head of the KGB, actively blocking legislation that, that would defend our elections from Russian attack. What happened? What happened? Well, you see, this is the thing. Ordinarily, I would be very leery of a former president um, for both tactical as well as moral reasons attacking, uh, attacking his successor as politically and as aggressively as Obama would. And I know that Obama appreciated the fact that George W. Bush mm -hmm. maintained mm -hmm. pretty much total radio silence, mm -hmm. you know, took to painting, whatever, during, during his presidency. Among other That's things. what happens in, during normal successions, normal transfers of power. What I think Obama is doing is filling a vacuum that has been left um, by the Republican Party itself. Where was Paul Ryan saying pretty much what Obama just said? Where was Mitch McConnell? Where were any of the leaders of Congress? The only one who stood up, of course, late and lamented was was John McCain. He provided that that leadership that is now absent. And that's why I think it's important for Obama to step up, because this is not an ordinary transition. This is not an ordinary period, because what Obama is defending isn't this or that partisan democratic policy. He's representing a tradition of Republican government that should transcend all politics. And he's speaking as a president, not as a leader of the Democrats. I heard from um, half a dozen Republicans today who said, my God, what I wouldn't give for four more years of this guy to get rid of Donald Trump tomorrow. Well, here's the thing. I mean, President Obama is speaking not just as a great American, which I think he is, and I think there's a role for, as you said, the gravitas of, of um, those who have those platforms um, and those reputations to come forward. But I think he's also, it's also very important to hear his voice because he's right. He said that uh, this is one of the most important elections in the lifetime of those who are voting. And I think he really does have the ability still to turn out the Democratic base. And um, if you believe that it's important to elect Democrats because the Republican Party has no longer held its part of the bargain in American democracy, um, you know, which I do believe at this point, then uh, Barack Obama needs to turn out those Democrats. It's really important. <laughs> Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.